and amen. We have been doing a series in the church these Sunday mornings on the blessings of the baptized and the spirit-filled life. And we're just seeking to place another little piece of the jigsaw together to give us a, a full picture, as it were, of the blessings that God has for us. And uh, the title of my little message this morning is The Scripture Pattern. The Scripture Pattern. That is, the Scripture Pattern for me as His disciple to follow. The Lord Jesus here in His Word, He, he said in His precious Word that we are to follow Him. Verse 26, If any man serve me, let him follow me. We are following one who's leading us. We're following one who's guiding us. We are not following a man or a denomination or a doctrine. We are following Christ. And as I've said and intimated on other messages, how do we know what a spirit-filled, what a baptized man looks like? Of course, the Lord Jesus is that perfect man. And that's the one who we're looking to and who is giving us the example for us to follow. And so we must look to Christ alone for the biblical pattern to follow. And if we stick to the scriptures, we not err into uh, uncharted waters or into heresy or false doctrine, and we not be deceived once we stay with the Word of God. I was just praying in the prayer meeting this morning, what would we do if we didn't have God's Word? If we didn't have the Word of God to guide us, it would be like the Bible said about in the book of Judges that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And when you even look on the news, uh, what's, what's happening even in the, in the Kirk in Scotland, the Church of Scotland, what they're bringing in and ordaining is so far removed from the Word of God. And uh, we can't accept that. And bless God, we have His Word to guide us, to direct us, and to lead us. And the amazing thing about the life of Christ, Jesus' life flowed out from his spiritual relationship with his Father. It flowed from his spiritual relationship with his Father by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost that indwelt the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to cover a little bit of ground again, Jesus was fully God and fully man. Two natures in one body. He is the divine as God and the human nature as man. And as we read in the scriptures there, he's referred to in the New Testament, Testament, verse 34, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus, who is this Son of Man. That's the, his human title and his divine title here in this human body. He's known as the Son of Man. So we need to recognize that Jesus came into the world in obedience to the Father's will. The Lord Jesus came into the world in obedience to the Father's will. John chapter 6 and verse 38, it says this. The Lord Jesus says, For I came down from heaven. There's his, his descent he came down from heaven. Heaven is, of course, his dwelling place, his abode, his throne. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will. He didn't come down to satisfy his own desires, but the will of him that sent me. Of course, his Father, God, he came as at the command of God the Father. And so we see immediately that the Lord Jesus, he came in obedience to the Father's will. We read in Psalm 40, verse 7, a prophetic word it said in the Psalms in verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book that is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And thy law, of course, is the will of God. Thy law is is within thy will, is within my heart. That was the heart of Christ. That's what he had to fulfill the Father's will, the Father's plans for redemption. And of course, the Lord Jesus' ministry it, it more than encompassed the redemption of man. It encompassed so much more 
the Lord Jesus fulfilled a mighty ministry, a mighty ministry as he came in obedience to the Father's will, not only to save us, but to empower us, to indwell us, to defeat, to defeat uh, the works of the devil, to defeat death, to take the keys of death. There's so much as we read the Word of God and study the Word of God that the Lord Jesus has accomplished for us that will be revealed throughout the countless ages of eternity. And so we want to understand Jesus' life. We need to understand a little bit about our own life. Because Jesus was fully human, fully man, as well as fully God. I want to look at this for a little moment this morning. The key to your life is your free will. Your free will. There's nothing more powerful in you than your will. And free will is a gift that God has given to his creation. Not only to us as the human creation, but also to the angelic host, he also gave free will. And as we're studying in the book of Job, these studies, uh, we realize there that God created Satan and those fallen angels perfect, but as a result of their act of disobedience and making that choice of their will, they rebelled against God, and as a result of that sin, of course, has come into the world. So free will is a blessing that God has given to each one of us. And so we need to understand how God has made us, what is our physical makeup and our spiritual makeup in the eyes of God. You know, we're more than just flesh and blood, aren't we? As I look down this morning, there's not two faces the same. There's no twins here. Some are older, some are younger. But in the eyes of God, we're all precious and we're all beautiful. Did you know that God never created ugly children? That's a man-made word. An ugly... He didn't create ugly children. They're all beautiful. They're all precious in the eyes of God. All precious. Man labels individuals, not God. All children are a gift of God. Every one of them. We are made in his image. Sin, yes, as a result of that, can deform certain parts of our body as a result of sin. But God loves you as you are. Listen this morning. You're beautiful. Whether you're yellow, red, black, or white, whether you have a full head of hair or no hair, whether you have all your teeth or no teeth, he loves you just the same. You're special and perfect in the eyes of God. So to understand a little about our own life and this free will, this gift from God, Paul writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, he said that I pray to God that your whole uh, spirit Spirit, soul, and body. Just let me quote it to you. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole, now listen to this, spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. We want to look a little about the facts about your life. I want you to know this morning that you're tripart. What do I mean tripart? Tri means three. There are three parts to you. The scripture says that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. There are three parts to you according to the scriptures, according to the word of God. God's order is from 1 Thessalonians 5.23, spirit first, soul, and body. Our order, we put it like this, we talk about body, soul, and spirit. Uh, we get the body first. We want to feed the flesh and satisfy the desires of the soul and the spirits away down the, the packing order. But that's not God's order. Uh, the Word of God is wonderful, and when you get into it and dig into it, there's some tremendous truth, tremendous truth that we'll receive from the Scriptures. So God's order is spirit, soul, and body. There's the body with the five senses of the body, the smell, the taste, the touch, 
Our sight and our hearing make up our bodily parts. And uh, through the ear gate, uh, the word of God is a sounding out this morning is coming in through the ear gate into the soul realm and into the spirit realm. You don't hear with this bit of flesh here. You can cut off your ear and still hear. The hearing is is internal, but it goes deeper than that. It's going into the soul. The word of God goes into the soul. Uh, The scriptures talks in the book of Hebrews 4 that the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing even to the to the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. You see, the word of God searches us. And so the the five senses of the body uh, relate to the external. And with our body, we touch the external world. I can feel, I can see, I can hear, I can smell, and I can certainly eat. And then we have the senses of the soul and the spirit. Because in the soul and the spirit, God has blessed us with this wonderful blessing that we call free will. Free will. Where God enables us to make choices, whether good or bad. And we have this blessing of free will, that glorious gift from God. And in that realm of our soul and our spirit, we have got our conscience, which is God's light in us. If you didn't know where that conscience, remember when the Lord Jesus says that the light that came into the world to light every man, that's, that's our conscience. Uh, the Bible talks about the, the candle of the soul, the light in us is our conscience that God has placed in us. Whether you're saved or not, you know the difference between right and wrong. I call it a writer and a wronger. Uh, Whether you're saved or not, you know the difference between right and wrong. That is then built by God in your conscience, which is part of your soul and your spirit faculties. There's our memory. There's our reason. Of course, there's there's the emotions. If, If I hurt my finger, I'll feel that in my emotion. If people hurt me with their words, I'll feel that in my spirit. Because you can have a crushed, and a damaged spirit as a result of people speaking harsh, unkind words over your life. And you can have a crushed spirit this morning, you know, like a rose. That someone that was been coming up beautifully and someone grabbed it and squeezed it. And all of a sudden that rose, instead of it flourishing and blossoming as it, has, as it should have, it's crushed and creased. And that's like a wounded spirit being crushed by negative words and, and, and by unkind truths. It crushes us internally in our spirit. And so the most important blessing and truth that God has revealed to me here is this free will. Free will. There are two departments of your will, if I can put it like this. Two departments. One department of the will is choice. What I decide to do. Simple illustration. Two glasses of water. Which one shall I drink from? And we make choices. You don't even know you're making choices. I'm going to drink from that one. I'm making the choice. Right? And then there's execution. What I decide to do and what I actually do. One is choice and the other is execution. So I have a free will to choose which glass I drink from. And as I drink from that, I've made the choice. You see where I'm coming from here. So there's choice and execution. And the free will God has given us makes that choice. It's God's gift to you. God didn't make robots. I'm not standing here and there's not a voice coming to me saying, Dar, don't drink that glass, drink that glass. But if I was to look at that glass and I was to see something dirty in it, with 
the intelligence that God has given me, I would know I'm not drinking that glass because it's dirty. I'm drinking this one. That's just a simple fact. I'm not being spiritual. I'm being intelligent with the blessings and the faculties that God has given to me. And so you're made in such a wonderful way in the image of God that you can make choices. Choices. And I want to tell you this morning that choices determine destinies. If you're here this morning not saved, the choice you make concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy and offer of salvation, to refuse that, you are making a choice. And the choice is that you will not receive the Lord Jesus' offer of salvation, and so therefore the consequences of that is damnation. The opposite to salvation is damnation. Now, God is not damning you, dear friend, this morning. You are damning yourself because you won't make the right choice, the right decision. And so this is the blessing about God's salvation. He's not willing for any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. And if you have the knowledge where you know you need to be saved, if you don't make the right choice, you condemn yourself to hell. That's the reality. God doesn't have conscripts in heaven. Heaven will be populated with men and women, boys and girls, sinners who repented of sin, lived for Christ, bore the cross, and will dwell with him in heaven. That's the blessing of salvation. Salvation is a free gift, but the cost is discipleship, following Christ. It's not a popular road. You can follow the popular Christendom today. And what I tell you, friends, there's hundreds and thousands in the popular Christendom movement. But very few walk the road of the cross. Jesus said in Matthew 6, or 7, didn't he? Matthew 7, 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. I'll tell you there's nothing straight about what the Kirk are proposing. And I can say that because it's in the public news. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Why? For wide is the gate, and broad is the road of Christendom, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, eternal life, and few there be that find it. The Lord Jesus is speaking in relation to Christendom, not the world. That's very important not the world. Not everyone who professes to be saved shall be in heaven. And that is scripture. For the Lord Jesus said to them, did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do this in your name? And the Lord Jesus replied, I never knew you. Never knew you. And so, dear friends, the choice you make will determine where you'll be. Choices are the hinges of destiny. Before I go any further this morning, have you chose Christ? Have you chosen the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And if not, why not? Give me one good reason. One good reason. A genuine, I don't want an excuse now. You know what an excuse is? That's just a lie framed up. That's all an excuse is. And the half-truth is a, is a full lie. Don't give me an excuse. Give me one genuine reason why you won't repent of your sin and come to Christ. Just one. Just one. Okay. So the two departments of the will. What I choose and what I actually do. Now, in, in, uh, in our own sea of days, we lived for ourselves. Not right. We lived for ourselves. We, we did what we wanted to do. 
It was gratifying ourselves. We go where we wanted to go, where we felt drawn, whether it was public houses, discos, dances, or if you weren't into that. But certainly it was all about feeding the self-life. What I want for me. I'm on the throne of my heart. It's body, soul, and spirit. I'm in the driving seat. It's not spirit, soul, and body. It's me driving, me in control, all my choices for me. Unsaved days. And then, when you came as a sinner to Christ, you received spiritual life. Spiritual life. You see, this morning we all have life here. Every one of us without exception. I can see you're moving. I can see life in you. So you've all got life, but I don't know whether or not you've all got spiritual life the life of Christ inside of you. I don't know that. But your lifestyle and your character and your conduct should portray the inner life of Christ inside of you. Jesus says, if you want to know what a Christian is, examine the fruit. If you want to know what sort of a tree, examine its fruit. Because you're not going to get pears off apples and you're not going to get apples on gooseberry bushes. Because like breeds like. And so the Lord Jesus said to us clearly, by their fruits shall ye know them, not by their lips. By their fruit. So if there's, if there's the life of Christ inside of you, there'll be evidence of that life. There'll be fruit. There'll be a desire for the word of God. There'll be a desire to grow. There'll be a desire to pray. There'll be a desire to know more of God. There has to be evidence of growth in the life. And so, we have received spiritual life. God is now living in your spirit. He's living in your spirit. Because really what had happened when you made that choice, when I made that choice that night over 28 years ago to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, what I actually did was I opened the door of my will. If I can explain it to you like this, I was going to get the wee whiteboard and try and maybe do a wee illustration, but it didn't work out. The Old Testament gives us a picture of man in the tabernacle or the temple. And it's divided into three, if you like, rectangles. A box, within a box, within a box. The outer large rectangle is what the Children of Israel encamped around the tabernacle and they seen this tent, you know, eight or nine feet high. They couldn't see, they couldn't see really into it, but they could see what was called the outer court. And then at the entrance of the outer court was the, the, the curtain, the doors, and the, the congregation took their sacrifices, their animals, and they brought them into the Levitical priesthood and they took the animals, they fled them, they slayed them, they took the blood, and in that inner court there, they, as they went in, they put that blood on the altar, and they offered up that sacrifice to God, which was by way of blood for that man's sins and his family to be forgiven, and he was accepted. So God was teaching, it's like a kindergarten. The tabernacle is like a kindergarten. God is teaching the children of Israel the Old Testament was this shadow and the New Testament is revealed in full because it's a typology of the blood of Christ placed on the horns of the altar. But then the, the priests took more of the blood and they went to what was called the Laven altar, the Laven, or the Laven, which was a picture of God's grace and they washed their hands in the water at the Laven, the laver, and then they, they took the blood and they went into what's called the Holy of Holies, which was this other box, this other chamber within the four. And the high priests and the Levitical priesthood, they were the only ones who had entrance into here. That was their calling. So they went into there, and in there, in that Holy of Holies, was the the table with the 12 loaves, which was called the showbread, 
There was the, the candlestick which burned, representing the light of Christ, the menorah. And then there was the uh, offer, the golden altar of incense, where they brought in and lit that altar, which symbolical of the prayers of the saints. And so you had all this ministration going on in there. And so this blood and these prayers would have been offered in there unto God for the nation. But once a year, in the holiest of holies, there was a veil. And the veil, if you like, I suppose it was as big as those doors at the back in the, in the, old, in the old Testament tabernacle this, in the wilderness. And once a year, the high priest, he killed the, the, the goat, the, the Passover goat, and he took the blood, and once a year he went in behind that veil on him alone, and he went in, and in the, inside that part of the tabernacle was the golden chamber. It's called the most holy place. And in there was the Ark of the Covenant, the whole walls were lined with gold, symbolical of the glory of God. The tabernacle sitting there with the cherubim, with their wings outspread, which was covering the glory of God. And inside the box of, the, of, of that golden box of the mercy seat was Aaron's rod and the bowl of manna, and the law, the tablets of the law. And the high priest went in and he poured the blood on the mercy seat, symbolical of the blood of Christ being offered to God for the sins of the people. That's a picture of the cross. And so inside the holiest of holies was where the presence of God dwelled. And that's where he met his people. In the new dispensation, in the New Testament, God doesn't live in buildings. God dwells in your spirit. You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And the fragrance of Christ dwelling inside your spirit. Romans 8, 16 says, For the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of of God. So he is dwelling and living inside of us. Isn't that a wonderful truth? To know that the eternal God lives inside of you and I. And so as we, as we look here, we see a picture of where God's dwelling in our life. We're tripart. And the spirit life is dwelling inside of us, this new nature that we have touched on and spoken on on other Sunday mornings. So now, by the grace of God, with our spirits alive, we have this new nature. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus met the woman at the well in John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 24? He said to her, there's a day coming when God shall seek them to worship him in spirit and in truth. We worship God in our spirit, not in a building. We're in a building this morning. We're, the building is not worshiping God. We are in truth in our spirit. And this is the day the Lord Jesus was prophesying to this woman at the well that after he would go to the cross and die, this day has now come in. This new dispensation, this new covenant blessing that we are enjoying this morning. And so this is God's order. Spirit, soul, and body. And with the spirit now alive, we touch the spirit world, and this is where God meets with us in our spirits. Because God wants the dominant role that the spirit, of, spirit man should be leading, influencing the soul and guiding the soul realm with this free will is to make decisions, and then we work that out in our body. And this is the wonderful order of God. So God's order is spirit, soul, and body. But the human life of Jesus as the Son of Man is different than the natural man like you and I. The reason I want to mention this is this. 
the Lord Jesus, he was born sinless and perfect as God, manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in flesh. God in flesh, God incarnate, God taking on a human body that we could follow him. This is a mighty, mighty truth and revelation that God in heaven who is spirit should take on a human body like you and I that we could follow him. And dear friends, that's a tremendous blessing. And I'll put a wee note down there. It is only because he became like us that we can become like him. Can we grasp that this morning? It's only because he became like us that we can become like him. Progressively. It's called sanctification. It's the process of growing up in Christ. We will never be sinless. The Lord Jesus was sinless. We will never be sinless. The Lord Jesus had the human Adamic nature. We have the Adamic sinful fallen nature. (laughs) Totally different nature than Christ. And that will never leave us until God takes us home and transforms us at the moment of death. And so this is absolutely tremendous. The Lord Jesus, born sinless and perfect as God, manifest in the flesh. The Lord Jesus was born spirit, soul, and body, alive and sinless. We read about that in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, about the first Adam was a living soul. The second Adam was a life-giving spirit. In other words, uh, the Lord Jesus, he, he's a life-giving spirit. He gives us spiritual life, where Adam, through procreation, gave us natural life. Adam couldn't give us spiritual life. We were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Adam could not give us spiritual life. We were dead to God. It's the Lord Jesus became the second Adam or the last Adam, and he gives us spiritual life because he took on human body. I hope I'm not giving you too much. hope this is not too heavy going this morning. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can, but this is important before we go into next week to see how uh, the Holy Spirit of God led this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God-man. All will be revealed. So Jesus is man. This is very important. Matthew 26, 39. Jesus is man, had a will of his own. You see, he's, he's fully man. And when we can grasp these uh, tremendous truths, in Matthew 26, 39, it says, considering here he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt. The Lord Jesus had a will of his own because he was fully man. How will of his own? But the glorious thing about the will of his own, and this is the keys to Jesus' ministry. And this will so bless us if we will apply it. The keys to Jesus' life as the Son of Man was that his will was wholly surrendered to the Father. Have you got that? This is why uh, on the Jordan River, when he stood there that day to be baptized by uh, John the Baptist, Because he was fully surrendered to the Father's will. Now, what do I mean by that? To put it very simply, is there some area of your life as a Christian that you have not surrendered over to the Lord? Some area of your life that you have not fully surrendered over 
to the Lord. We are growing as Christians progressively, but I want to tell you, when I was saved, ten days later, I came to this place here. With what limited light that God gave me, because I didn't know the difference between Genesis and Genesis, I had no Sunday school upbringing, biblical education, no knowledge of the Word of God, totally ignorant, oblivious, without understanding great depth of spiritual truth. But I had a desire in my heart to give God my life. That's what I mean by full surrender and give Him at all. I wasn't holding any area of my life back from God. He was getting it all. And ten days later, in prayer, crying, weeping, thanking God for saving me, I prayed a simple prayer. Just like the simple prayer I prayed when I come to Christ. Lord, I don't know what I have done. This is what I'm praying. Lord, I don't know what I have done. This it's confused. I'm a bit confused. Of course, the devil was hammering my mind and telling me, oh, you're not saved. You, didn't, you made a fool of yourself. You come up in front of all that congregation. You don't even feel saved. And he was hammering my mind, and I was believing him. I didn't know there was the stranger's voice as well as the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I was confused, and I was saying, God, I don't really know what I have done. What did I know? I knew I was a sinner, I didn't want to go to hell, and I knew Jesus was my Savior. And in simple childlike face, I trusted him. And that night in my wee little study at home, and I prayed, Lord Jesus, I don't know what I have done, but I know you're real. He's real. And I said, Lord, I, you have saved me. I believe it. And this night... I'm giving my life to you. All of it. And you do with it, Lord, what you want. Amen. And the tears were dripping off my chin onto this brand new Bible that my cousin had brought to my home. And after I dried my eyes and tried to dry the pages, I read the first verse. And I can show it to you. There it is. It's underlined. As you read any book, I'm taught to read the top left hand corner. You read it at the start of the page. And it said, And I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And that come to my heart with such assurance. Not in an audible voice. Thank God I don't hear him in an audible voice. You've been looking for that every day. He spoke to me from his word. And whether I feel saved or not, that word will never change. Never. Wonder does John Stewart feel saved today? The word of God never changes. And I started my journey and my adventure and my relationship with God. Fully surrendered to the Father's will. If I wouldn't have done that ten days after I was saved, I wouldn't be your pastor or minister today. I made the right choice. The right choice. God didn't force me to surrender my life to Christ. And he won't force you. But out of a heart of love for what the Lord Jesus has done for me in saving my soul, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege. It's such an honor.
to surrender to him. Hallelujah. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing we sang in all my life is serving you. For I want to know you more. More. I'm as hungry for God today as I was that day. And Mandy and I have been through many trials and troubles and tears and tribulations and heartache and heartbreak on how God has revealed himself through the darkest of days that he's worthy to be trusted, that he's worthy to be worshipped, and that he's worthy to be served. But he won't force your will. And if you want God's best for your life, Give him the best. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your land. He doesn't want your, ha- ha- he doesn't want your farm. He just wants your heart. Because that's all you can give him. This was all I realized, Lord. I just can give you my life. That's all I have. And I realized I've only one life to give. And I've only one life to live. And I want to give the Lord my very best. Because there will be a day in my life when people will be celebrating my departure to glory. And it will be over. Give them all. And this is why the Lord Jesus could be filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost in the River Jordan because he had surrendered all. All. Have you surrendered all? Do you know generally the last thing to go? The wallet. We love it. I wonder to these money preachers in America, what do they love? What do they love to get from their people? You never hear them talking about meeting for prayer. They just love robbing them. They even have a cash machine in some of the churches. Maybe get you to sign up a direct debit man. They're not interested in making disciples. They're interested in increasing their bank account. Write a few more books. Get a few more planes. Bring some more family into the business and sure they don't even pay tax on it. What deception. Surrendered? Abandoned? It's all about the self. The self-life. Jesus' example, he didn't live for himself. He never even performed a miracle to get food for the table. He never even asked the people for money for the temple. And all you get in many of these churches, they're pleading for money. Jesus sent Peter to the lake, and he got it from the fish. Oh boy, if we would just stick to the word. And very quickly, not only was the Lord Jesus fully surrendered, the key to his life also was his obedience to the Father's will. You see, it's one thing to say, I surrender all. Do you remember in the great convention meetings years ago, Tom Shaw talked about it. He said he was old enough to remember days of tremendous blessing and the faith mission in Bangor and great conventions and up at Killy Dees when the power of God was moving and we stood, sang those hymns, you know, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. And we're all caught up with the Lord, I surrender all. And 
I'm coming to the altar now. And there was the altar called and they were all there. And everybody was surrendering all. And then we left the meeting. And we got settled back into it because you've got to go back to work. You remember the Lord Jesus, the mountain of transfiguration? Wonderful for Peter, James, and John. Maybe see all that glory. Boys, it would come down with motivation. But it says this, you can't live in the mountaintop. You can't live in that experience that you had 30, 40 years ago. You can't live in that. You have to collect the Lord Jesus. You have to come down from the mountain. And you have to live in the valley and go in amongst the common people and do your day-to-day work. But the Lord Jesus, when he was in the mountain, he was fully surrendered and he was obedient in the top of the mountain of transfiguration and he was just as obedient in the valley of conflict and trial. See, this is the thing. And you're saying, I'm surrendering all. Have you? Well, then why aren't you obeying God? Why aren't you obeying the word? If you're surrendered. You're, it's, a, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy to say I've surrendered all to God. And we're not obedient to his word. The Lord Jesus said I'll take delight in you if you obey my word. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if ye have love for one another. Do you love your brother and sister in Christ? Do we love them? So the Lord Jesus was able to be filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost because he obeyed the Father's will. Jesus lived in total obedience to the Father's will. Now I'm not preaching sinless perfection. Not a chance. Because I don't believe it. But I am preaching total obedience to the light I've received. Total obedience. Because that's what the Lord Jesus said to his disciples. Follow me according to the light I'm giving you. Obedience. King Saul lost the kingdom because of disobedience. Do you know the difference between David and Saul? Both men fell. Maybe David fell more severely than Saul because he, he, he killed a man and he took his wife and he committed adultery and all of those things. But the difference between David and Saul was this. God seen the man's heart. Yes, he sinned. He, he did terrible things. But he had a heart for God. And he repented. And God restored him. And you know what David's greatest cry was? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I don't believe as a Christian God will take the Holy Spirit from you. He'll not. But you'll have so quenched him. You'll not be sensitive to his voice anymore. Because of the dominance of disobedience in your life. And so in closing, are you surrendered fully? And obeying the word. Amen. Let us pray.